<laughs> My name is Larry Arn. I work here at the college. That other guy was Whalen. He's like an English prof who gets his, his uh, uh, pronouns wrong sometimes. Um, we have some distinguished P. Oh, I, I, did you like the choir? Yes. Yeah. And that second piece, uh, the choir director, Jim Holloman, who's a meister, he knows that I like the Scandinavian composer, the modern guy, Martin Lords, Lordson, and that was one of his. And, um, and they're great, and David made the point. These kids have about two hours a week to practice, so they work hard. Uh, so we have some distinguished guests here, apart from our guest of honor, and I'm gonna name some of them. Um, first of all, the, how would you put it? The first man of the Department of Education <laughs> is the great Dick DeVos. He was uh, almost elected governor of our state, and God, wouldn't it have been better if he had? Uh, uh, Secretary DeVos's mother, Elsa, and her husband, Rick Brookhuisen, Brookhuisen are here, and recognize them, please. And uh, her son and Dick's son, Rick DeVos, and his wife, Melissa, are here. Are you, are you the one who works at Amway now? No. I keep wondering who's running that place. Um, seems to be going great, though. Okay, we have other distinguished people. We have the Senate Majority Leader, Mike Shirky, is here. And the uh, Education Committee Chairman of the Michigan Senate, Lana Theis, is here. That's it. Where is she? Hey, good job. She's been down here to talk to me. She's pretty good. Uh, Kurt Wilder, former member of the Michigan Supreme Court, was supposed to be here. And because he couldn't make it because he got canceled, I get to tell you before I tell him that the Board of Trustees of the college have in, uh, voted unanimously to invite him to become a member. And, and if you don't see his name on our Board of Trustees list, it means he's a dirty dog. Uh, our local prosecutor is here. And he's been a great man for as long as I've known him, which is 20 years. But he's done some really great things this summer. And I'm not even going to tell you what they are, but they're awesome. Neil Brady, please stand up. <laughs> he, he gave the most eloquent speech at a, at a Hillsdale Academy athletic banquet I've ever heard. He, he stands up and he says, He's a volunteer coach. He says, I coach boys. Boys like wood. They like to hit things with it. They like to cut it. And they like to burn it. That's what boys are like. <laughs> and then he was finished. <laughs> it, was a, it was a deep insight into human nature right there. Did that video make anybody think of Margaret Thatcher? I've been privileged to know the secretary for 20 years. Uh, she came here about three weeks after I came to work here and wanted me to support her voucher initiative, which I did. And I warned her that it might not work because it's very hard to make those work. But she just soldiered on. Um, it's not despite, you know, of all the colleges in America, we are the ones totally unbeholden to the United States Department of Education. <laughs> no. uh, 
We'll start taking its money six months after they get rid of it. <laughs> it's not uh, despite, but because of that fact that I admire our speaker tonight. We do not think here that education is not a function of government. It isn't constitutionally prescribed in the federal constitution, but right from the beginning, they found artful ways to support it hugely. 136 to the Western land, starting with Michigan, right here. And then that was given as an endowment to the states to provide education in each township for the purposes of religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. So that means that education is a hallowed thing in any great country and a concern of its gover government, even if here it's to be run by the state governments. But we've lost sight of what it is. Because like everything else, it's run in a central way according to bureaucratic rules and that is destructive of the whole phenomenon. The greatest fighter against that, that I have seen, and I'm old now, right? I've seen them all, is our speaker tonight. She doesn't need this, any of this. Uh, you know, any fair account of the thing would have to be, this is a sacrifice for her. That kind of public service today, by the way, is like war. It's like taking casualties. And she volunteered for that. Now, how's she done it? It starts with the fact that she's a mother and she has some children. And she raised them. Some, one of them's here tonight. She watched them learn. She thought, What's that about? Look how that happens. Then she was interested in schools. Of course she was. Her kids are going to go to school. She had the plain common sense to think, how would you organize the school, except in a way to tap the force of a mother and a father's love in the education of the child? Isn't it barbarous that we lose sight of that today? Isn't that one of the grimmest signs of the times. Not her. She's volunteered for everything uh, all her life. Uh, she's uh, done hard duty when it comes to her. Never complains. Uh, I've never seen her get angry. Although I thought in that video, you know, the things that have been done to her they're just simply indecent, right? And she's not scarred by them in any way. But she does seem mighty ready to fight. She's done two things of great imagination that I can name. Uh, one of them is, <laughs> see, you know, all these Ivy League colleges are apologizing that they are racist institutions. You know, which, by the way, is entirely implausible, right? Does anybody ever meet racial discrimination at Princeton, you know? At Williams College, they can hardly have college these days because the woke movement disrupts classes and stalks people. And, and st students at Williams College in Princeton, they chant at people, you are killing me with your whiteness. Whereas in fact, they're among the most privileged people on earth. Right? And so, you know, come to find out, I didn't know it, but because I don't do that, but uh, if you get the money from the federal government, you have to certify every year that you're not a racist institution. <laughs> and so they made a public announcement that they were. And she wrote them a letter and said, wow, what about this? <laughs> Which of these two things is true? That was very embarrassing. <laughs> I just... When I heard that, I went, gosh, look at, listen to that. That's a, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> the second thing is, she wants to implement a federal tax credit. She might talk about that tonight. She can talk about whatever she wants to. But uh, what that would be would be for families to get part of their federal tax 
back for educating their kids as they please. Now, I want to tell you what that's parallel to. And also, I'll tell you, I'm shocked to discover that many Republicans and many people in the conservative movement can't see the truth of this. The device that was used in the Land Ordinance of 1785 and in the Northwest Ordinance extended all across the nation. And the device that was used in the, in the Morrell Act signed by Abraham Lincoln is the federal government has an asset and it ought to delegate or, or uh, uh, yeah, delegate that asset to the states to let them do the great things that they're, that they're em empowered to do. Education chief among them, right? And so the federal government has no business regulating education in detail, but what if it took part of its great largesse, which is way beyond any right calculation of its needs, and let the, let the people have that. It would be spent in the states, of course, because everybody lives in a state. And let them choose. And then you would restore the connection between a mother's love and the education of a child. And the breaking of that is the end of civilization as it continues. And the best person I've seen qualified to do something about that is our speaker, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Well, good evening, everyone. Before I begin, I want to just take one point of personal privilege and thank uh, so many of my family members for being here this evening. It is special indeed. I don't get to have them um, with me that often. And um, I'd also like to apologize for the fact that you're going to have to listen to a second speech from me. <laughs> but um, thank you so much, Dr. Arn, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you for your leadership here and your unparalleled commitment to the diffusion of sound learning. That line from Hillsdale's charter is by itself a noble charge. Put in the context of your founding, it becomes a higher calling. Your found founders believed then, as we still do today, that education is the means by which we secure the God-given blessings of liberty. And under Dr. Arn's bold leadership and clear-eyed vision, Hillsdale continues to be a fertile oasis for those who seek truth in higher education in a higher education landscape that seems to be rapidly deserting it. Hillsdale's founders welcomed anyone and everyone who wanted to learn, with malice toward none, with charity for all, long before those words from Abraham Lincoln carried America's conscience, your charter was the first in our history to prohibit any discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sex, or any other label by which governments divide us. From being an early force for abolition, to turning away the government's regulators, to rejecting taxpayer subsidies, Hillsdale's hallmark was is and always will be independence. <laughs> and let me add, though I always admired that independence, having been witness to the federal bureaucracy at work for ne nearly four years, I can tell you with certainty, your decision to decline any help from Washington was wise then and it's still wise today. <laughs> so earlier this afternoon, I was pleased to visit with some of you and learn more about what you're doing to rethink education. Students are benefiting from a classical approach to learning and internalizing first principles from the first texts of our framers. It's also encouraging that many Hillsdale graduates begin their careers at the front of the classroom, often in schools launched as part of your charter school initiative. From Idaho to Florida, 
The initiative has helped open more than 24 public charter schools, serving more than 12,000 students currently. More schools are slated to open soon, and they couldn't come at a more important time. Across America, there's massive unmet demand, especially right now. The COVID crisis has laid bare a lot about American education. Parents are more aware than ever before how and what their children are or are not learning. And far too many of them are stuck with no choices, no help, and no way forward. Sadly, too many politicians heed the shrill voices of the education lobby and ignore the voices of children, parents, teachers, and health experts who are begging to get our students back to learning. As for me, I fight for America's students. I fight for their parents, and I fight against anyone who would be, have government be the parent to everyone. Now, many in Washington think, because of their power there, they can make decisions for parents everywhere. In that troubling scenario, the school building replaces the home, the child becomes a pawn, and the state replaces the family. That sequence has played itself out too many times throughout the course of human history. My family has deep roots in Holland, the Netherlands. And I think of the debate that took place there during much of the 18th and 19th centuries and beyond. In the interest of time, I'm going to truncate history a little bit. For a time, parents in Holland raised their children according to their customs and their beliefs with little supervision from the government or its schools. But the French Revolution brought with it the idea of a one-size-fits-all school system, one that the Dutch were arguably too quick to adopt. Over time, the view that education was a responsibility of government, not of parents, grew to prevail among Dutch elites. Independent schools were illegal. Parents had no options and no hope until they met Abraham Kuyper. This pastor turned politician became a rousing voice for parents who were not happy with their government, one which claimed the right to set up the school for all children. A system that Kuyper said summons their children from their homes yet increasingly erases every distinctive feature of families and provides uniform guidance to every child. Kuyper asserted that the way forward was to separate education from partisan politics. He said that the family, the business, science, art, and so forth are all social spheres which do not owe their existence to the state and which do not derive the law of their life from the state. And so, Kuyper argued, the state cannot intrude into these spheres and has nothing to command in their domain. He made very clear, the education of children is within the family sphere. So parents are called to determine the school, the choice of school for their children. For most of his political career, Kuiper was a voice for parents and a fierce defender of the family. A few years before his death, Dutch families won a constitutional amendment in 1917, which gave children's futures back to parents. And today, more than a century later, they are in control of their education dollars to pay for their kids to attend the schools of their choosing. Let me suggest, we could fix education for so many children in America if we, to borrow an old phrase, go Dutch. <clears throat> that means we embrace the family as the sovereign sphere that it is, a sphere that predates government altogether. It's been said, after all, that the family is not only an institution, it's also the foundation for all other institutions. The nuclear family cultivates art, athletics, business, education, faith, music, film, in a word, culture. And just as the family shapes its culture, it also shapes its government. That truth is contained in our founding. Here, we the people govern, because we know what's best for ourselves and for our children. 
and we consent to a government that exercises only those duties we delegate to it. Our schools exist because we pay for them. So we should be empowered to spend our education dollars our way on our kids. I like to picture kids with their backpacks, representing funding for their education, following them wherever they go to learn. In this sense, public and private schools alike don't exist to supplant parents, they exist to supplement them. Now some claim this would cost too much, but like so many arguments put forward in this debate, the facts just don't bear that out. Every year, American taxpayers spend about $739 billion, that's billion with a B, on government education. More than $15,000 on average per student per year. And spending increases year after year after year. Now I can imagine what you're thinking. I could educate my child for $15,000 per year. I'm told your academy here at Hillsdale charges less than half that much. You could improve your child's outcome with that kind of money. A single parent in Detroit or Flint or Grand Rapids could open the door to a better life for their child if only they had control of how taxpayers' dollars are used and spent on their child's education. America's parents agree. There's a mighty chorus, and it's rising in volume and urgency, supporting parental school choice. Countless surveys show that more families today want parental choice than ever before. A recent clear, Real Clear Opinion survey found that three out of four families with children in public schools want their education dollars to follow their children wherever they go to learn. Notably, 73% of black families and 71% of Hispanic families say they want the same thing. So school choice is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Fortunately, when is now for some students in Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, and even Illinois, who today have more choices than they did four years ago. But we're just getting started. I spent more than half my life alongside you fighting to resurrect the rights of parents in education. More than 30 years of time and treasure devoted to giving all kids the same opportunities my own kids had. In fact, I've been working to reform education since soon after Jimmy Carter bent to the demands of big union bosses and created the department I head today. Now, I assume most of you have never stepped foot inside the U.S. Department of Education, and I can report you haven't missed much. <laughs> These past few years, I've gotten a close-up view of what that building focuses on, and let me tell you, it's not on students. It's on rules and regulations, staff and standards, spending and spring, strings, on protecting the system. Forty years later, taxpayers have spent more than $1 trillion at the federal level alone trying to fix K-12 education. The results speak for themselves. Just open up the nation's report card and you'll see what I mean. America's gold standard assessment of academic achievement reports the appalling result that two-thirds of our nation's students can't read like they should. Two out of three. Now those are just some numbers, but behind the statistics are real consequences for real people. Put yourself in the shoes of the father whose son, a recent high school graduate, was honored in the local newspaper. Dad's pride turns to dismay as he discovers his son can't read or comprehend the article about himself. Dad marches over to the high school principal's office, his son and the newspaper in tow, and asks his son to read the article to the principal. He, of course, can't. The father pointedly asks the principal how he could have graduated his, graduated his son or anyone else who can't read. There is no defensible answer. I think of my visit to an Indianapolis prison. The warden shared with me that the biggest problem there is not violence nor discipline. It's illiteracy. 
These are very real consequences of government overreach into every part of our lives. When I took on this role, I said from day one that I'd like to work myself out of a job, that I'd, like to, that I'd work to empower parents, not politicians. To that end, we restored state, local, and family control of education by faithfully implementing the Every Student Succeeds Act, by ending Common Core, and by urging Congress to put an end to education earmarks by consolidating nearly all federal K-12 programs into one block grant. We expanded the in-demand DC voucher program by 50%. We supported the creation of more public charter schools with a particular focus on opportunity zones, 70% of which currently have no public charter schools. We reform the tax code so families can use tax-preferred 529 savings accounts for expenses related to K-12 education. We joined Montana parents in their fight all the way to the Supreme Court, ending the last acceptable prejudice made manifest in bigoted plain amendments, which deny students the freedom to pursue faith-based education. And we support the Bipartisan School Choice Now Act, which would directly fund families and empower them to choose the best educational setting for their children. A majority in the United States Senate voted in favor of Senator Tim Scott's School Choice Now provision. I think you all know Senator Scott and his story. His life experience demonstrates how education can change lives. He said his mother knew that if we could find the opportunity, bigger things would come. And for students like him, who by no fault of their own are denied opportunities, he knows firsthand that students need access to more of them right now. Families could use these scholarships to enhance distance learning or to pay for other costs tied to educating children at home. They could be used for tutoring, career and technical education, or transportation to a different school the scholarships could support students attending the school that best meets their needs or matches their values. At the end of the day, we want parents to have the freedom, the choices, and the funds to make the best decisions for their children. The Washington Knows Best crowd really loses their minds over that. They seem to think that the people's money doesn't belong to the people that it instead belongs to the public, or rather what they really mean, government. Winston Churchill pointed out the danger in missing the difference. He said there's a kind of voluntary socialism that says, all mine is yours. But the kind of socialism government forces says, all yours is mine. Too many today, especially among our rising generation, don't seem to understand the dangers of such a view. They somehow have come to believe that socialism is the cure, not the deadly disease it really is. Tragically, it's because no one has taught them differently. And worse, some have been indoctrinated to believe not in themselves, but in government. We know more than half of today's high school seniors have what researchers call a below basic knowledge of American history. In the real world, that means more than half of our young men and women don't know what the Lincoln-Douglas debates were about. They can't identify that a photo labeled Berlin 1989 depicts the fall of the Berlin Wall, nor do they understand the significance of those momentous events. And it's not just history we've failed to teach them. America's cities ablaze today witness a failure to teach the things that make the American experiment work. It's ignorant to hate capitalism when you don't really know how communism hasn't worked. It's ignorant to hate freedom when you don't really know how tyranny hasn't worked. So the unholy mob thinks our economies need redistributing. It thinks our constitution needs rewriting. It thinks our families need restructuring. One prominent group was explicit about its desire to, quote, disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure. That's taken right from the old Marxist playbook. It admits the goal is to, quote, 
do away with private property, and educate children on a communal basis, and in this way, remove the two bases of traditional marriage." End quote, mercifully. Even Marxists know the family is it. The family is at the center of our economy, of education, of culture, and it's under attack today. Recall what's being said about Judge Amy Coney Barrett's big family, as if raising seven children is something to be embarrassed by, or worse, ashamed of. Perhaps that comes from a small-minded and offensive view that American women cannot be devoted to their families, be smart, hardworking, faithful, independent, successful, and be conservative. What we know to be true What we know to be true is that women can be all of those things. So tonight, let's proclaim with one voice, that dogma lives loudly within all of us. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton warned that the triangle of truisms of father, mother, and child cannot be destroyed. It can only destroy those civilizations which disregard it. Some, however, suggest we should simply throw in the towel and accept what is at the expense of what could be. These folks cower at the crowds, lament legislative losses, despair over court decisions, and resignedly say, this is the new normal. They tell the rest of us to accept that we really are living in a culturally post-Christian nation, that we'd, be that we'd best retreat to a makeshift monastery and leave culture and country behind. Others feel forced into a self-imposed silence because what was once the beginning of discourse is now the end of acceptance. Cancel culture has invaded the workplace, the neighborhood, and friendships. In today's modern town squares, Facebook, Twitter, and the like, one can't publicly express a conservative view without inviting scathing rebuke, or worse, censorship. Ronald Reagan warned this would happen when he so presciently predicted that if fascism ever comes to America, it'll come in the name of liberalism. After all, haven't we watched those who talk tolerance turn around and behave like some of the most intolerant people on earth? To be sure, this environment makes it harder to protect principle, to defend what T.S. Eliot called the permanent things. Hillsdale's great friend Russell Kirk famously enumerated a few of them. Charity, justice, duty, fortitude, and freedom. We need those permanent things now more than ever, and they require our defense now more than ever. This was true in Abraham Kuyper's day as well. Dutch families were concerned about government control and cultural decay then, as we are today. Many there also called for a retreat. But Kuyper called an isolationist impulse the grand lie. He asserted that we each have a calling in the midst of the life of the world and that we cannot neglect the world. Importantly, he reminded us that the school is one of the chief instruments precisely for enriching people. Ultimately, Kuiper said that arrows do not exist simply to be kept in the quiver. At some point, they need to be placed on the bowstring. Now, I know some might shrink from that metaphor, but the moms in this room know what I mean. We know what to do with an arrow when our family is under attack. So instead of canceling the culture, let's answer Kuiper's call to challenge the culture with education. Instead of rewriting our Constitution, let's return to its timeless words and restore the power of we the people. Because we don't believe in retreat. We believe in redemption. Let's begin by reasserting this fundamental truth. The family is the first school. If we recognize that, 
then we must also reorder everything about education around what the family wants and what the family needs. Make no mistake, America cannot win the future if we lose the rising generation. If we get the family and its freedom right, everything else that's wrong about our culture will right itself. Rebuild the family, restore its power, and we will reclaim everything right about America and us. So as our founding fathers did long ago, let us pledge our sacred honor to rediscover and resurrect all that makes us great. We are families. Education is our sovereign sphere, and we are taking it back. Thank you for keeping Hillsdale a fountain of ideas for America and her students. Thank you very much.